Hello friends, what do you do if your former spouse fails to pay child support or alimony? Well, we've got you covered on today's video. We are going to talk about motions for contempt and enforcement. Welcome back to the Divorce Broadcast. My name is Manny Segarra coming to you from Miami, Florida. All right, so I know a lot of the viewers that are watching today can relate to the topics of this video, which is non-payment or late payment of either child support or alimony. What usually happens is that the payments start coming a little bit later. Maybe they're late by a week and then they start becoming late by two weeks. But at some point it gets to where the checks stop coming or the payments stop coming. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Essentially what has to happen is the person who is supposed to be receiving either the child support or alimony has to ask for court intervention. And that usually is in the form of a motion for either contempt or a motion for enforcement or both. Just a brief explanation of what a motion for contempt is. It is simply a document that the person who did not receive either the child support payment or the alimony payment files with the court. Contempt means that you are asking the court to use its inherent authority for ordering contempt against the person that is non-compliant with the court order. You're invoking the jurisdiction of the court. You're filing this motion and you're asking the judge essentially, judge, this person's not making these payments. I want you to get them in trouble and I want you to help me get them to start paying again. A motion for enforcement on the other hand is simply a document just like the most freaking time you would be asking the court judge please have this person continue to pay their child support and or their alimony payment on time sometimes a motion for contempt can ask for certain sanctions whereas a motion for enforcement is just simply asking for the court to enforce the order regarding child support and alimony some of that a person is going to file a motion for contempt and or for enforcement first thing you got to look at is whether or not there's a valid court order that's right is there a court order Order requiring the other party whether it be an ex-spouse or the parent of the child to pay alimony and or child support or both usually this court order is in the form of a final judgment of dissolution which is the last order that's entered in the case but it can be entered in a temporary order while the case is pending and it could be also entered in a order after a specific hearing the next step that must be taken is to determine if the person who has the obligation either to pay child support or to pay alimony is on notice of the order. This means were they ever served or given the order that requires them to make payment. So this is something that it usually appears on a court's docket. Oftentimes you can look at the order itself and you will read around the last couple pages. The judge will say who was present and how that order was disseminated to the party. So it's a very important step. Now that the motion for contempt and or for enforcement was filed and that person was on notice of that court order, the next step is to request a hearing date. Oftentimes these issues have to go before an evidentiary hearing in front of the judge. Sometimes it'll get referred to a general magistrate, but nevertheless, this issue must be addressed by a court. So a request for hearing is put into effect. Usually the hearings will be two or three months down the road. Sometimes if the dockets are full, it'll be four or six months down the road and a hearing date is eventually set. Before the hearing, it is very important to start thinking about how it is that the person who is aggrieved, who filed the motion for contempt and enforcement, must prove their case. Well, the first step is to see if the payments are made either through the central depository or the state disbursement unit. In Florida, there's a state disbursement unit that has very copious records of child support payments. So it's a great resource. This is often tied to what's called an income withholding order, meaning that a lot of times the person who owes either the child support payment or the alimony payment will have their wages garnished. So the central depository or state disbursement unit or whatever it's called in the other jurisdictions will keep notes as to these payments. It is important to get a certified copy of these documents. The second place to look to see whether or not the payments are made is a review of the person's personal bank records, meaning the person who is receiving the child support or alimony, those personal 
bank records will show any types of deposits so that if the person who, who is required to make the child support payment or the alimony payment either makes it by check or Zelle or Venmo, those payments will be included in the person receiving the alimony or child support, their bank statements. Those records will lay out what payments were made, what payments weren't made. And that's essentially how you can prove that the person who is supposed to pay child support alimony did not make those payments. Usually that's the little bit easier part. So the next step is to show that the person who was supposed to make the payments had what's called the present ability to make those payments. It has to be today as we're sitting here in court and or during the period in which the child support payments were made. A quick practice tip, let's say that there was a final judgment that required there to be child support or alimony payments. This previous court order, according to Florida law, it creates in subsequent proceedings a presumption that this person has the ability to pay support. That is very important because a lot of times people come into child support court or they haven't paid their alimony, kicking and screaming and say, I never had the ability to pay. Uh-uh, that's not true. So the presumption as they walk in the court is that they had the ability to pay. So they have to try to show that they didn't. But if they try, let's talk about how the person who is aggrieved or who is owed the child support can actually demonstrate that they did indeed have the present ability to pay child support either right now, today, or during the time that they were supposed to make the payments. All right, so enough with the legal ease. Let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about the specific areas to look when trying to determine if someone had the present ability to either pay child support or alimony. And the first one is the obvious one. Look at their bank statements. Those records will be subpoenaed in order to show the money that they had on a monthly basis. In the bank statements, there's a lot of really important information to show if they had the ability to pay. The first of which is the deposits. There are a lot of companies now do direct deposit in terms of people's payroll, and that's great. You get to see what the person earns, but if there's miscellaneous deposits like cash deposits, those should raise a red flag to see where they're getting their income from from and where that money went. In addition to that, at the end of the month, you will see how much money is left over in a particular bank account. So let's say that the person was supposed to pay $500 a month. They didn't pay $500 a month in child support or alimony for a year. That person's bank records are subpoenaed and they are collected by the opposing side, trying to show that this person had the ability to pay child support. And lo and behold, during that year period, there are a couple months where they had $1,500 or a couple thousand dollars left over in their bank account and they didn't make their $500 a month child support or alimony payment. They they are going to have some explaining to do when they show up before a child support enforcement judge or general magistrate. Speaking of the bank statements, one of the things that I love to do when I have a motion for contempt or enforcement is I like to separate out what the actual expenses are. I will look to see, was the rent paid and how much was the rent? What about a car payment? What about cell phones? You know, these cell phone plans are so expensive. Did this person buy a significant amount of alcohol over the course of the month instead of making their child support payment. What about dining? What about restaurants? Did they go out to the club? Did they go to South Beach instead of paying their child support? What about gym memberships? Video games. Video games are huge, but they're so expensive. What about vacations? One of the best ways to get people who are delinquent in their child support or alimony is to show that they spent money at an all-inclusive resort or they went on a cruise. If you think judges don't like vacations, what about gambling? Same thing goes with cigarettes or cigars. Finally, one of the things that I also look at is the overdraft charges. A lot of times overdraft charges from banks can be like 30 bucks, 50 bucks. If you add them up, it looks really bad. So all of these expenses can be used against the person who has not paid either child support or alimony to show that they have the ability to pay child support, but rather than pay child support for their children, they spent it on these things instead. 
Next up is the financial affidavit. The financial affidavit shows some of these expenses that we talked about. A lot of times a person will be required to show what their income is, what their deductions are, and then there's a whole slew of questions about personal expenses. It gets into maids and lawn maintenance and service contracts and tolls. So what that person who has not paid child support or alimony puts in there can definitely be used against them if they paid for those expenses instead of paying child support. Up next, it's for my friends who own businesses and run all of their personal expenses through that. Does your business pay for your gas? Does it pay for your health insurance, for your cell phone, for your tolls, your eating expenses? If it does, it could look a little suspicious to a child support court, especially when you use your business card or your business as a way to pay off some personal expenses. Next up, the court will look obviously at the person's pay stubs. This can be obtained from an employer by a subpoena. If the person who has to pay alimony and child support is self-employed, then it becomes a little bit more difficult and you will be looking at some of the things that we had just discussed. Next up is the income taxes. That's right, if a person is a W-2 employee, then it's pretty straightforward. They'll file their income taxes based upon what they earn per year. If the person is self-employed, you will have to look at the corporate taxes and and see if there's a profit or a loss and if any of the deductions are reasonable. One of the things that can also be looked at is the person's assets. The court is not limited to simply consider a person who owes child support or alimony's money or cash. They are able to look at their assets. So is there proof that they have a nice watch like a Rolex? Is there proof that they have nice jewelry, nice shoes, luxury goods? If they have a new car, a new boat, or a new motorcycle there are some protections for like a home or a retirement account but some of these other assets are something that the court can definitely look to liquidate in order for the person to make their child support payment one of the big areas to consider is social media posts. They show updates as to what is going on in that person's life. If the person who owes child support or alimony posts on social media that they got a big new promotion or that they're going on some awesome vacation somewhere or that they won the lottery, these are great areas to look at in order to determine how to prove that this person had the ability to pay child support. Another way that the court can determine if the person had the ability to pay child support is to look at their passport. They get stamped at different countries. So if the person owes child support for a year, a copy of the passport's obtained and the passport shows that there were five trips internationally, either to Europe or to Asia for long periods of time, that may be proof that the person went on a trip instead of paying for their child support. And one of the final areas that the court can can consider is an area that a lot of people don't consider or know about and that is the in-kind payments specifically Florida statute 61.30 includes an income what's called reimbursements or in-kind payments to the extent they reduce living expenses so let me give you an example let's say the parties get divorced the husband's now living at mommy's house and mommy pays for his car payment and his cell phone well whatever the Amount of the car payment and the cell phone is will be imputed as income to the husband or the former husband if it is continuous without seeking reimbursement so that's another way to show that there's money to pay child support so after a contempt finding is made that the person that was supposed to pay child support didn't and they had the present ability to make the payment the key is compliance the court will use its inherent authority to try to get that person to comply and one of the first ways that the court will try to get the person who owes the money to comply is by issuing what's called a purge yes it is as scary as it sounds a purge is essentially an order whereby the court says hey we had this hearing I saw that you had enough money to pay child support during the time that you didn't and or I see 
in your bank account now you have enough money to pay child support you have the present ability to pay it therefore I'm gonna give you two or three weeks to make that payment and if you don't you're going to jail and I've seen it they enter different purge amounts it's usually because there's money left over after a month or there's some asset that's there maybe the person has a Rolex or a new car or a new boat and the courts like you got to make sure you make this payment and what's great about it is that the courts according to the decisional law in order to pay the purge amount the court is not limited to money rather the court is able to look at all of the assets that are in the possession of the person who owes the child support so purge jail is the first sanction that the court could consider the next sanction, not as awful as going to jail, but it's also a very tough sanction. And that is that the courts, at least here in Florida, can suspend your driver's license. Yeah, that hurts. If your driver's license is suspended, how are you getting to work? How are you getting your children to school? I hope your pets don't have an emergency that you have to take them to the doctor because you, you can't drive. How are you going to take your new boyfriend or girlfriend on a date? Yeah, I guess you can be on foot patrol or public transportation. Maybe you do Uber. But what's funny, if you do decide to do Uber, a lot of times your monthly Uber bill of the person who is supposed to pay the child support is more than what the child support payment actually is is and that driver's license will be suspended until you get your child support reduced to a certain amount and the court will decide what that amount is if you look onto the department of state website you will see that if you owe more than twenty five hundred dollars in child support you are ineligible for united states passport that is right so you want to go on vacation with your new significant other or family no no you want to go on a cruise with your children because you want to go on the disney cruise that ain't gonna happen either because your passport don't work anymore after you get a certain amount of outstanding child support arrearages another one that a lot of people don't know about is that your occupational license may be suspended so if you're a barber beautician esthetician even in the financial industry so tread carefully Another very serious sanction is that oftentimes the child support or alimony payments are deducted automatically through an income withholding order or through the state disbursement unit. And what ends up happening is if the person who is paying child support is found to have not complied or owes a significant amount of child support arrearages, when the federal government gives out refunds or some other money, then a lot of times the federal monies will get redirected to the person who's owed child support. Another sanction that the court uses, and I've seen how it works and it really gets to people, is that the court requires the party who has not complied with child support to seek employment and have to submit a weekly log as to their efforts until they find a job. That will get old soon because you're going to have to either stay online all the time to apply or walk around to every store that you can until you try to find a job. And finally, if it is determined that there are arrearages for either child support or alimony that have accumulated during the delinquent period, then the court will add that to the amount that is already owed and the new payment will be higher than the old payment and that's a wrap on the motions for contempt and enforcement remember that creativity and being a sleuth are essential when trying to determine if the person who owes either child support or alimony had the ability to pay it and for those of you who are thinking of not paying or delinquent and paying, get it together, people, because these sanctions are rough. So if any of you know anyone who would benefit from seeing this video, send it to them so that they can review this and figure out what they're going to do next. You can look us up at www.cigaralawfirm.com. We have offices in Miami and Orlando, Florida. Se habla español. Do us a favor and like this video and subscribe to the divorce broadcast. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you.